Guess what I'm going to preach on this morning? Yes! I'm finally, finally, I'm ending our series on love. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Okay, now listen. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 7, we've been doing this. Um, I preached this first sermon on this series of love halfway through the month of May. Can I just stop and say something right now? If you are dealing with, in your life, having to love people deeper than you've ever had to before, it is no coincidence that Holy Spirit's asked Pastor Chester to preach on love right now. How many of you have, since I've started preaching this, you've had to focus on loving a little bit harder than you were in the past? Come on, raise your hand. Don't lie. Okay, good. Some of you got two hands up. That's, that's not good, okay? Now listen. And so my point to saying that is no matter what has happened over the last two months in your life, I'm not preaching this sermon because I know your circumstance. I'm preaching this sermon because the Holy Spirit said preach on love, and I started doing it uh, two months ago, okay? So if the shoe just happens to fit this morning, well, then put it on and wear it. Okay, good. Wednesday night, I uh, did part six. This is part seven, and we're going to move on next week. Amen. If I could speak all the languages of earth and all the angels, but did not love others, the Bible says I'm nothing but noise. I'm, oh, Danny sitting right there. Come here, Danny. We're going to be here real quick. Danny in love told me Wednesday night after church. <laughs> he said, Chester. <laughs> yeah, you tell him. I told him. I want you to dance like nobody's watching. Okay. Which means? Which means stop asking you for amen somehow. <laughs> and so I look over there, and I've been doing this already this morning. And so, Danny, thank you. You may be seated. I love you. Thank you. Turn around. Turn around. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. So he's like, Chester, he's like, Pastor Chester, he said, you just go for it and don't care what, if they amen. I'm going to try my best to leave my hands in my pocket <laughs> and not say stuff like, oh, why aren't you amen, amen, okay? Because I look like that guy on Men in Black, huh, sugar water, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> right. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, okay, good. You're, you're a bunch of heathens. Okay, good. Now listen. So I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to look over at Danny. I mean, like, and Danny's going to give me the eye. If he gives me the eye, I'm going to stop asking for amen. This is the last time I do it this morning. Say amen. amen. Now, if you would just do that, I wouldn't have to. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> So if I could speak all the languages of earth but did not love others, I'd be nothing but noise. <laughs> this is going to be so hard. Verse 2, let's just move right along. If I had the gift of prophecy and knew the mysteries of God, if, if, if I had all the secrets of heaven but did not love others, I would, the Bible said, be nothing. It's working, Danny. This is awesome. Verse 3. If I gave everything I have to the poor, sold everything I had, left my family, went on the mission field, and, 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 and just gave my entire life, but did not have love, I would gain nothing. Verse 4. Love is... Remember uh, in the movie Forrest Gump? Remember that movie? I mean, how many have watched the movie Forrest Gump? Okay, God, see this? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm joking. That's like religion. That's dumb. Okay. At one point, Forrest Gump makes this statement. He says, I may not be a smart man, but I know what love is. Right? But I know what love is. And his mother, who loved him, had taught him and showed him what love was. And, and, and even somebody who had, was a gifted, talented young lady, she, and, but, but she was damaged from her youth, she might have been uh, the most gifted person but didn't know what love is. And here he is, ungifted, but he knows what love is. How many of you, when you see love, you recognize it? Yeah. Love is patient. Raise your hand if you have patience. <laughs> Patience. 
Love is kind. Raise your hand if you possess the ability for kindness. What? Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. You could say that backwards by saying this. Love is selfless. Amen? Does not demand its own way. I believe I preached on Mother's Day that one of the most selfless uh, images you're going to find in all creation is the love of a mother. Right? It's a woman who gives of her life for, for her children and, 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 and does not think of herself first, but thinks of her husband and other people first. And, and that's one of the greatest pictures of love that you're going to find on this earth. Amen? Amen? Does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. I'm learning that. Say amen. amen. Okay. okay, this is going to freak me out today. So I'm just going to be normal and then, <laughs> never mind. It keeps no record of being wronged. Love does not say... But do you remember that one time when? Love does, not, the, the love does not utter the phrase, I told you so. Right? Love keeps no record of wrong. It does not rejoice with injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. In other words, love cannot join itself to injustice, but must join itself to truth. And so when there's truth, Love will join itself to it. So if I find in the church body that we do a little bit too much um, participating in the joy of other people's faults and failures, and we don't do enough participation in the success of other people, somebody can come up here and get a prophecy and then get a word from, from a prophet, and that prophet may say, you're going to win the nations, and you're going you're to be one of the greatest evangelist preachers, and instead of us um, supporting one, yes, go, go, go. There's a spirit of competition amongst the brethren. And it's like the story of Joseph and his brothers who are jealous of Joseph and his dream. So love doesn't do that. And this sentence we're going to cover today and I'm going to be done. Love never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. Before I say anything else, I want to say, oh, the overwhelming, perfect love of God, amen, who never gave up on Chester Ed Passmore the third, who never lost his faith in Chester, who never gave up hope, who was always hopeful when I was at my very worst, he still hoped in me, who endured with me through everything I put him through. Because he is love, he could do this. Amen. Amen. And so it is hypocritical for us to say we are like Christ, Christians. Hypocritical for us to say we are Christians and to receive all that type of love from him. The never giving up, never losing faith, always hopeful and doing through all circumstances love from him. But not display that towards others. If I am like Christ, then I'm going to treat you the way Christ treated me. Woo. So love never gives up, number one. Love never gives up. Most properly translated, love bears all things. It comes underneath and lifts the load of whatever you're going through. Love bears all things. Now, this Greek word is stego. Everybody say stego. It's a verb. And it's translated bear or suffer. You could translate this word, love suffers all things. Yay. Right? How many of you want the kind of love that makes you feel goosebumps, right? You want the kind of love that makes you happy. You want the kind of love that makes you give, uh, have joy. But how many of you want to enter into love and call it love when you're having to suffer through a relationship but love suffers all things. Well, I don't know if that's Bible. Well, it's really the most basic form of Bible because my Bible shows me the love of a man who laid on a cross and suffered all things for me. Amen? 
Greater love has not, has this, not, no greater love has this than a man would lay down his. That's suffering. This is good preaching, Pastor Jester. Love suffers. And that word means this. It means, honestly, it means to protect or keep by covering. The word picture is this, is love builds a house over it. Remember that cheesy phrase that, you know, love builds the, the, the home or what I kind of, you know, you know, the little pictures that all you, uh, what's, the, what's that thing my mom used to buy, the little pictures, the, uh, it wasn't Pampered Chef, it was the, remember, how many I'm talking about? It wasn't Mary Kay, you know, back in the 90s, and she bought these cheesy pictures that were ugly today, right? But back then in the 90s, they looked good, and it had all these cheesy quotes like, love builds a perfect home. Well, that's true, because love puts a house over it, it covers it, Amen? But this is what it really means. It means to protect by covering, to cover up with silence, to keep secret, to hide, conceal the errors and the faults of others. Somebody, you need to hear what I'm about to say this morning. I'm going to take a volunteer in the house. Somebody raise your hand. Chad, no, that's not a good idea. (laughs) Come here, Tito. Just stand here and look pretty. Anytime you're ready. Okay, now listen. (laughs) I don't. I don't know. I need. I need somebody else. One more person. Okay, you you football and come here. Come here. Come here, Caitlin. Walk around. Don't go over. Walk around. Everybody, give Caitlin a hand. And give Tito a hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not here. Caitlin's walking down the street. She's walking or she's driving it with her parents down the street. And, and, she's, and, she's, and she's going down the street and she sees this man. And he's standing in a shady little spot. And he's standing there and he's talking to somebody else. And it looks like they're exchanging money for packages. <laughs> now. Love builds a house and keeps silent and covers and puts it in a vault and protects. <laughs> what? Biblically, she's an adult. She's not a teenager. She's an adult. It is her duty with that information to come to him and say, did I see you, you know, yeah, doing such and such. And he's like, no. Insurance. <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so she says, okay. I choose right now, d- despite what I saw, I'm going to believe the best. But the problem is that the next day she's going down there and she's got two witnesses in her car. And they're driving down the road, and they see the same thing. So she comes to him directly with her witnesses and says, we saw you. And he confesses. He says, you're right. I'm struggling. I've been doing this wrong. I need help. I have sinned. Love bears all things. Never gives up. It builds a house over it and keeps it silent. And her job there is to go to, am I really, really loud? Okay. Her job there is to go to him with her witnesses and whatever authority in her life, biblically, and her job is to administer reconciliation. Right? You've sinned. I'm, I commit to you to help you deal with this. I'm, we're going to hold accountability. We're, you're you're going to repent. We're going we're to make sure that this, you get over this phase of your life. Amen? Amen. Because love says, I'm going to build a house. And not only am I building a house, but I'm coming in the house to live and to help you through this process. Amen. And we're going to kick out of the house sin, and we're going to fill the house with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> but that's not what she did. She picked up the phone. 
Wait, I don't even know what that means anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Siri. <laughs> Siri, call Aaron. Aaron, I need you to pray. Aaron, I need you to pray right now. We have a serious problem. I know, I know, we, we, I know I can trust you. We need to pray. I saw Tito, and he would, hangs up. Hey, Siri, this is a big demon. We need lots of prayer warriors. <laughs> Call Chafin, Chafin. I saw, blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you know, in the name of prayer, in the name of wise counsel, we have tore the roof off the house. And we are exposing him rather than operating in love. Amen. You think this is how God can be seated? Thank you, even man. You think that? You think that Jesus was sitting around with his disciples? You think this is the heart of Jesus sitting around with his disciples and said, "Hey, John." You see how Peter's doing that? You see how Peter's acting that way? I want you to learn a lesson, buddy. You don't need to have that kind of spirit like Peter does in you. You think that's how Jesus operated? Well, why do we cover, why do we uncover our brother and sister in this pseudo-Christianity bull jargon and call that wisdom when in actuality it's nothing other than un? Loving. See, love, my duty is to speak the truth to you in love. So I go, if, 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 if okay, first of all, if you come to me, this is, I love this. This has happened many times. Can I just say this? There's probably not one singer who sang on this platform that someone hasn't complained to me about. <laughs> Let's just go there. All right, good. Can you believe the way she was dressed? Can you believe the way she moved? Can you believe that she was going for all the attention? Can you believe that this person was doing this? This person was doing that. That person was, and this person, she cut that person. And, and, and people come to me all the time. And they, come, and they say things about people. And here's how I handle it almost every time. Okay, then let's do this. How about you come with me? And we'll go talk to them. Oh, no, I just came here to give wise counsel. <laughs> Amen, Jonathan. I just, you know, it's my, my job was to see it, not to fix it. <laughs> well, let me help you. Everybody in the world sees everybody's problems. But there's a few people who operate in love and who actually want to be part of the answer and not part of the problem. So if you're not willing to be part of the answer, then shut your uh, mouth. <laughs> Love, it's literally, it's put a lid on it. It's, everybody take your hand, put it over your mouth, put a lid on it. What you saw about them on Facebook. What you saw, put it, it is not your job to spread things. It's your job. If you want somebody to talk to, how about Jesus? How about praying for them? How about saying, God, I don't understand the situation, but before I say one word to any man, any flesh, I'm going to talk to the Spirit. Yeah. Amen? You know why? Because we have more confidence in our flesh than we do in the Holy Ghost to change the situation. Yeah. And so there's a good word right there. So love, love builds a house over things. And I am guarantee you across this room, there's not one person in this room who can stand up and say, I'm guiltless in this area. Amen? So may we all take up our loving to another level. And may we choose to be houses of safety that want to take people through a process of reconciliation rather than being bullhorns of bull crud. Amen? 
<laughs> okay, good. I think I lost you at bull crud. Okay, good. <laughs> Let's move on. Number two. I mean, by the way, Peter has this uh, verse in chapter 4, verse 8. He says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. How do you show deep love? For love, what? Sin. Why do we in the, in, the, in the Bible Belt Christianity think it's our duty to expose sin? It's always been, always will be the Holy Ghost duty to expose sin, and it's our duty to love and cover them. Good, let's go to number two. Number two is love never loses faith. Love never loses faith. It means this, it believes all things. Pesteu in the Greek. It is translated 239 times as the word believe. Its root word is the root word for faith. So you can say that love keeps faith and believes all things. It means to think to be true or to be persuaded of. Persuaded of. It means it's used in the New Testament of the conviction and trust. And it's also the New Testament word for where we come for saving faith. Now, when I say the word saving faith, we assume it means salvation from uh, being lost. But saving faith is not always just being out of sin into salvation. Sometimes you need saved from the situation you created. And so love always participates and never loses the faith and continues to believe that you could be saved out of whatever situation you might find yourself in. The moment that I give up on you is the moment that I have stepped outside of love. Oh, how many moms have I canceled in, 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 in a place of counseling and their son strung out on drugs and, and he haven't, they haven't spoke to him in years and, 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 they're, and, and they're in and out of prison and, and, and from all accounts, it, from where I'm sitting, it looks like it's a hopeless situation. But how many moms who will continue to believe and it has nothing to do with she has a deeper love for him than I do because love never gives up. It never stopped believing. Don't stop. Believe. Heathens. <laughs> never stop believing. If Journey can get it, why can't you? <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> Moving on. You know, if you can't believe in the individual because of the actions you see, the Word says train up a child in the ways that they should go and they'll never depart from it. But how many know our children have displayed actions that have not been according to our training? So if I can't trust the action I see in my child, I have to trust the training that I had put in my child. But there's always something to hang on to. There's always something to not give up on. There's always something to still believe in because at the end of the day, the Holy Ghost is a big, powerful force that can move the hearts of men if I will put myself in a place of prayer, place of prayer and not lose the battle of faith. That's a good word. I'm doing better, Danny. <laughs> you sarcastic people, I love you. Love is always hopeful. Never loses hope. Most important, or go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, please. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It's, it's, it's translated as exactly how it reads. It's always hopeful. Never loses hope. For if we are going to maintain our hope, we have to maintain our love. In the moment I stop loving the person in the situation, the moment I lose hope for them in the situation. Amen? The Word says this. Matthew 12. This is a good word right here. Verse 14. The Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. Now, how many know that's not a good meeting? 
How many know that that's not a hopeful situation? There's one Jesus, a few disciples, and most of them are scared most of the time. If you don't believe that, read John chapter 11. Okay, most of them are scared most of the time, and there's hundreds and hundreds of Pharisees. You know, the battle is, is kind of rigged, and they're plotting how to kill Jesus. Well, the verse 15 says this, Jesus knew what they were planning, so what did he do? He left the area, and many people followed him. He healed all the sick among them, but, the, but he warned them not to reveal who he was. He's like, hey, I need you, you know, I'm glad your eyes just got open, you were blind, but shh, they're trying to kill me. This fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Listen to this. This is Isaiah 42. This is the Greek rendering of Isaiah 42. Look at my servant, Jesus, whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Everybody say justice. Yes. Good. He, now listen, this is what he, he is full of love. And this is how he responds in a situation full of love. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. Public being defined here in the Greek is a.k.a. Facebook. <laughs> he will not fight, shout, or raise his voice in public. His love demands his character is different from the other guys. You will see at the end of Jesus' life, there's a whole group of Pharisees who are publicly raising their voice and shouting, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Because a Pharisaical religious spirit will shout in public, but Jesus, like a lamb being led to the slaughter, was silent. He sits there and, and even in the midst of him being conspired against and being wronged by all these people, he was so gentle that he would not crush the weakest reed or, put a, or, or even move his voice strong enough to blow out the flickering candle. But what is the picture of us when we lose hope and we lose love and we walk into anger and we're, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Which, by the way, is that house of safety we were supposed to build. Finally, because of the way he loves, because his love is so different than any other love, because his love won't blow up but actually will lay his life down, it will create justice and victory. Then Isaiah... 42.4 says this. The rendering of his name, verse 21. Uh, did y'all get through 21? Verse 21 of Matthew 14, verse 21. About 5,000. Uh, it's, it's chapter 12. It says this. It says this. His name will be the hope of all the world. His name, Jesus' name will be the hope of all the world. That's rendered in, in Isaiah 42, 4 like this. Listen, you have Isaiah 42, 4. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails through the earth. Love, who is love? Christ is love. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails. Why? Because love never, always, always, always hopes. It never loses his hope. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Right? And we will stand in a worship service and we'll lift our hands and we'll sing that about God over us. And walk out of the sanctuary. And look at our brothers and sisters and say, I refuse to love you to that type of level. I give up on you. I falter, right? I quit on you. How can we receive that kind of love and then not give that kind of love? It's the highest form of hypocrisy. Come on. If Christ is in me, if love is in me, then love must come out of me. 1 Corinthians 
13, 7 says this. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Go back to our main passage of Scripture. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. This is my last point. Endures through every circumstance. That word endures is hyponemo in the Greek. It means, again, it means endures. It means to abide in. And it also means to suffer every circumstance. Ladies and gentlemen, love is not what Hollywood told us it was going to be. Come on, somebody. This time, I'm asking for one. Love is not what Hollywood told us it's going to be. Amen? Amen? There's a lot of days the choice to love is the choice to be wounded. Amen. There's a lot of days the choice to remain in love is the choice to suffer and to hurt. Is to grieve with. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures for every circumstance. That word endure means this. It means that basically it refuses to quit. It will not recede. It refuses to quit. Woo, Jesus, help me. In your life, I want you to think about right now who have you quit on before? What you've quit on before? How many of you ever quit a job that you wish you'd have kept? My senior year, this is a dummy illustration. My senior year, I decided not to play high school basketball. I quit a year early. You want to know that I have more dreams about playing high school basketball? You know why? Because it's the thing I quit, I gave up on. I used to be skinny <laughs> and could jump and stuff, kind of. <laughs> or at least be fast. You know what happened that year? I lost my love for basketball, and so I quit on it, and I've regretted quitting on basketball for years and years and years. When you lose your love for something, you'll quit on it. Because love never quits any circumstance. Now, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's permission in the word for sometimes for us to quit on certain things like, right? Like a marriage in certain circumstances, right? I'm not here preaching condemnation. If you've ever gone through a divorce and you have biblical grounds, I'm not telling you that you're a loser and you've gone to hell. Amen. But I am telling you, that I have seen marriages where they had biblical grounds for divorce, but chose instead to love. And now, many years removed from the situation, it couldn't be any better than it is because even though they had to suffer through a season of something, they chose a higher calling of love and it produced in them a higher level of marriage. Because something is permissible doesn't make it the perfect will of God in my life. Boy, that's a good word. I want to say to you that love is a spirit that doesn't quit. In my marriage to him, I have put him through betrayal. I have hoarded myself on him to the things of this world. I have lied to his face. I've cursed him. I've been so angry with him. I've said things that I wish I could take back. I've quit on him. I've told him that some things were his fault when they weren't his fault. Some things actually the devil did I blamed on God before. I have treated him with disdain. I've taken him into situations in my life that he didn't want to be a part of. I have put him through things that he didn't, uh, he didn't want to be a part of. I have, I've drugged him into situations in my life that were 
that were way beneath his feet. But you know what he never, ever, ever, ever did? On my worst day, he didn't quit on me. When I was quitting on me, he didn't quit on me. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you right now, a spirit that quits is self-preserving. And the essence of a self-preservation spirit is the essence of an antichrist spirit. If you're quitting on your relationships, if you're quitting on your church, I can't stop right there, I just got to. If you're quitting on your family, if you're quitting on whatever it is, you have made a decision to step outside of love There's a passage of scripture I want to read to you, and then we're done. First John. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. Everybody who doesn't want to sin, raise your hand. <laughs> if, you, if you didn't raise your hand, uh, we need to talk. If anyone does sin, raise your hand. If you do sin every once in a while, you know, maybe like once or whatever. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate. You know what? He is actually, he's, his name is Jesus, but he's actually made of DNA strands that are love. If anyone does him, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who truly is righteous. He himself is the sacrifice because love suffers that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Verse 3. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. Stop. Go back to that verse. If I ask many Bible Belt Christians, what are the commandments of God? You know what they say? Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Right? And they'll, ask, they'll list for you ten commandments. Okay? And they'll list for you a list of things you should not do. But Jesus said, behold, a new commandment I give you. And his new commandment was love God, love people. It wasn't don't do something. It was actually step from the arena of not doing something into the arena of doing something. And that something you should do is love. So we can be sure that we know God if I'm loving. If I'm loving him and I'm loving you, then ladies and gentlemen, I am, I'm knowing God. Good. Verse 4. If someone claims I know God <laughs> but does not obey God's commandments, that person is a... Someone says I know God, but they're destroying a house of secrecy. If they are losing their hope, if they are losing their faith and they are quitting on you, then that person does not love you and they have a problem with God. That person is a liar and not living in the truth. Truth demands love. Amen. Speak the truth. And Jesus said, oh my gosh. Jesus said, I tell you the truth and the truth's going to set you free. Amen. Because love spoken in truth brings freedom. But where, but, where, but, where, but where facts spoken outside of love produce more bondage. The fact is, I saw Tito doing something that was wrong underneath the bridge over there. But the truth is, is that if I speak the love of God into his life, he will be set free. Yeah. I really didn't see that's a, that's a hypothetical situation. You know that, right? <laughs> I owe you food. Okay, now. Um, those who know God's word truly sh sh show how completely they love him. The word is to love. That is how we know we're living in him. Verse 6, how do we know? Because of love. Uh, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did, which was the example of love. Uh, go to uh, Philippians. Don't you, know, don't you go to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Let the same attitude be in you. Humbled himself, died on the cross, right? Amen. 
the definition of what love is. Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one that you have from the very beginning. The old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. Verse 8. Yet it's also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you are also living it for the darkness is disappearing and the true light is ready to shine. Verse 9. If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a Christian brother or sister, the person is living in darkness. Now what's the definition of hate? Basic deduction says the opposite of love is So if I'm giving up on you, that's an attribute of. Is it quiet in here? If I'm losing faith in you, it's an attribute of. If I'm accusing you, it's an attribute of. By the way, who's the accuser of the brethren? Yeah, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. If I say what Satan says and I'm speaking in the same spirit Satan speaks in. I'm living in the light. That person living in darkness, verse 10. Verse 10. Is there verse 10 up there? You got verse 10? No? Okay. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in light and does not cause others to what? You know how most of us are stumbled up? What is stumbling? The word stumbling block is the word in the Bible for offense. We become offended at each other whenever we operate it outside of. So whenever um, uh, um, um, Caitlin tells Tito's junk and Tito finds out about it, she has become a stumbling block of offense instead of an agent of love. So ladies and gentlemen, look at me and hear what I'm saying right now. The reason Jesus and Paul and these guys can list gossip as one of the major sins of the Bible is because gossip is causing the brethren to stumble every day. And if you are taking in gossip, if you're getting on the phone and you're calling and you're speaking and you're backbiting and you're backstabbing and you're gossiping, then you're absolutely operating under a spirit of antichrist. And you are damaging the body of Christ. And the best thing you can do is put a lid on it. Anyone who hates another brother or sister hates is operates outside of love. Anyone who operates outside of love toward another brother or sister is living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. We get so sucked into the webs of gossip and lies and innuendo and all this kind of stuff that we can't even see clearly which direction we're walking anymore. And I can't even trust my own heart. I can't even trust my own motive. I can't because I am blinded because I have chosen to operate in an antichrist spirit. And what I need is to get on my face, repent before God, and ask Him to send the light of His love that I can see clearly what He sees again. Did I go verse twelve or is that it? I think that's it. Stand up on your feet. I want you to give me verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13. Ladies and gentlemen, for seven sermons, I'm trying to get a point across to you. If you want to live like Jesus and you want to be known as love like Jesus was known as love, you're going to be patient with people. If you want to be like Jesus, you're going to be kind to people. Whether they deserve it or not is no consequence to you. (laughs) Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Love is not jealousy. If, if If you're operating in a spirit of jealousy, it's not love. Love is not boastful. It doesn't, doesn't puff you up and not proud and put you on display. Actually, I'm, you should be as, as happy to put someone else on display as you are yourself. Amen. 
Love is not rude. Verse 5. No matter how bad she messed up your order at the restaurant. You give me a scenario that calls for rudeness. About the only thing I see in the word of God that called for rudeness, and this is the truth, is when Jesus was dealing with religion. Love does not demand its own way. If it has to be your way, you're not operating in love. If you have no ability to compromise with someone, if you have no ability to hear their side of the story, if you have no ability to have agreement with somebody, then you don't, then then it has to be your way or the highway, then you're not operating in love. You're operating in dictatorship. Amen? Amen? Love is not irritable. If you're easily irritable, you have a love problem. Amen. It keeps no record of wrong. I don't care what your wife did five years ago. Don't care what your husband did five years ago. I don't care what they said. It still hurts. That's because love suffers all things. Love keeps no record of wrong. I don't care what the pastor did to you. I don't care what you did to the pastor. I don't care what, the, uh, what somebody, your co-worker said. It doesn't matter. The record has been washed away. I choose not to remember. I, I can't help remember, but I choose to daily forget it and forgive it. Verse 6, is to not rejoice. If you find pleasure in somebody else's demise, you're sick. (laughs) Right? Right? Love does join in and rejoices in truth. We have got to get a lot better in the body of Christ about celebrating truth with each other. When somebody comes to you with a revelation, I want you to celebrate with them. Amen? Verse 7. If you're, if you're giving up on a situation, then this is your prayer. God, give me my love back for this situation. If it's a marriage, give me my love back. If it's a career, give me my love back. If it's a business opportunity, give me my love back. If it's a, if it's a, a relationship, give me my love back. Amen? Love doesn't give up. It doesn't lose faith. It continues to believe when everything in this world screams, you're an idiot for believing this. Amen? Never loses faith. It's always hopeful. And it does not quit. I want to drive a quitting spirit so far out of this place. And replace it with a spirit that, uh, of love that says, through thick and thin. I mean, literally, literally. Come here, babe. 17 years. I didn't, I didn't plan this, by the way. But this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> 17 years ago yesterday, I stood and looked her in the eye. And I said, in sickness and in health. When we are healthy in our bodies, it is good. When we are healthy in our minds, we're both thinking good thoughts about each other, happy thoughts about each other. (laughs) When we're completely healthy, it is awesome. In sickness and in health. But whenever your body gets sick, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to quit on you. When your mind gets sick and diseased with thoughts of murder <laughs> towards me, I'm smart enough to hide, but I'm loving enough not to quit. I'm not going to quit when you can't believe the best about me anymore. I'm still not. I refuse to quit. That's love. 
When everything in this relationship is, 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 is damaged, I made a vow. Not to love once 17 years ago, but to love every day for the past 17 years and the next 17 and the next 17 until Jesus comes back. Amen? In sickness and in health. In There was other ones, weren't there? What? For richer or poor, she married a preacher. The option was never for richer. She knew from day one it was for poor. And still she said yes. She did crazy things because of what? So whenever we're sitting here and we're going on a vacation and we're just spending money and her toenails are pretty and, 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 and all this kind of stuff and we're just spending money, boy, it's great. We love each other. And when we're eating Ramen noodles and Vienna sausages and, and we get to splurge and have macaroni cheese with cut up hot dog in it. <laughs> Love says, I don't care how bad it gets in the financial world with me and you, we don't quit on each other. I remember one time, long time ago, I said, I'm going to, we made like literally $300 a week combined salary, both of us working full time for a church. And I took one week's pay and to try to put it into an investment that turned out to be, <laughs> and I lost all $300 and here we are living paycheck to paycheck, dollar to dollar, day to day. I lost the money. I sat down, I repented to her and I said, baby, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I'm going to ask you to forgive me. I'm going to fix this. And she stopped and corrected me and said, no, we are going to fix this because we are one. What's the other one? Sickness and hell. For better or, huh? For better or for worse? For better or for worse? I should know this, shouldn't I? <laughs> Who wants to get married? Come see me, okay? <laughs> Y'all just get along. <laughs> Have at it, right? <laughs> for better or for worse? It is not a problem loving her when it's better. And trust me, she produces most of the better in this relationship. But the times it has been worse, and we have had worse times. The reason I can stand before you and say there has been no other person on the planet who has displayed to me the love of God more than this woman has is because she chose when it would have been easy to quit. Because love endures through every circumstance. Happy anniversary. Right. Seven sermons to get these three or four verses across to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you, and I challenge this church, if we're going to go where God has called us to go, if we're going to do what he's called us to do, if we're going to operate at the level that he's called us to operate, we have got to increase our love. We have got to make the conscious decision and by the help of the Spirit to go in a deeper place of love. If we're going to prophesy and pray that, and, and do it in a way that's going to change nations, then we've got to prophesy and pray from the standpoint of love and not prophesy and pray from a standpoint of judgment. Amen. We need to go deeper in love.